Hi everyone. The fifth challenge we're going to look at is that of transference. So in transference, the goal is to transfer knowledge between modalities, usually to help some primary modality we care about, which may be noisy or with limited resources. We're going to look at two types of transference, one with transfer via foundation models, and the other one via co-learning. So the first sub-challenge is to look at transfer via foundation models. In this case, we're going to assume that we have large-scale pre-trained models on one task involving some modality, for example, BERT train on language modality, and the goal is to perhaps adapt this um, large-scale pre-trained model, train on large amounts of data, into some other modality that we eventually care about, either through some fine-tuning process or some adaptation process. And there are several approaches to do this. Um, one common approach that has come out recently is how can we take a language model pre-trained on language data and uh, get it adapting to work on a tasks involving both vision and language. And one key idea here is to do prefix tuning. Can we take an image, put it through a visual encoder, and perhaps attach it as a prefix to these large language models before the text? And this has been shown to work pretty well. Once you start fine-tuning this model with just this visual encoder and freezing the rest of the layers, you can start getting it to work on certain task types of QA tasks with a zero shot, so without actually seeing any QA tasks at all. Uh, one shot outside knowledge VQA because these large language models contain some amount of implicit knowledge. And you can also start doing few shot image classification from both the images and the text that, um, that comes after it. So this is known as a uh, prefix tuning, adapting these language models, um, which have already been pre-trained via the prefix and using a small amount of parameters while keeping most of the language model parameters fixed. Now, what if you want to go deeper? Apart, if you don't want to just look at the prefix and go deeper into a language model, there's also some approaches that work on adaptation via representation tuning. So these representation tuning approaches essentially look at the self-attention layers into the model and adapt them so that they don't just take in language that self-attends to each other, but also audio and visual. So one idea here is to take in audio and visual information in the form of features put it through an attention that allows you to dynamically weight what is the contribution of audio and vision on top of language, and use that to shift language, which allows you to obtain a shifted language information, a representation that is conditioned on the audio and visual data that comes in. So you can think about it as language by itself without audio and visual as the center of your point. You can either shift it in positive directions uh, with positive audio-visual input or negative directions with negative audio-visual input. So that's adaptation via representation tuning. Another way of doing this is to essentially just train one multimodal multitask model at the same time. And this has been popularized recently because of the intriguing possibility of using transformers as encoding many different types of input data, all in the form of uh, sequences. So one recent method that came out of this is this high MMT model that aims to build one unified model with parameter sharing that enables you to do multitask and transfer learning across multimodal data. The core idea here is that given a series of tasks, each defined over several modalities, first try to standardize these input modalities into a common format. And a common format here is the fact that they are all sequences. So language can be seen as a sequence of words, Images can be seen as a sequence of pixels, audio as a sequence of uh, audio spectrograms. A disclaimer is that it is not clear whether this is the best way to do this. Like People have found that this works, but it is still unclear whether standardizing everything as a sequence might lose information about the inherent structure of these modalities. But if you go with the assumption of standardizing everything as a sequence, you can then apply, put them as a sequence, and apply modality-specific embeddings that allow you to identify these sequences. And once everything is standardized, can we attempt to put the same unit model and multimodal layers as shared parameters on top of this model? This would then allow us to train a task-specific classifiers, train for each specific task, and train this overall model through multitask learning, you know, updating the parameters uh, for tasks wherever those modalities are used for. And the key idea here is that this then allows you to have the same model architecture and also the same, almost the same parameters, except the modality uh, embeddings and the task classifiers to do a suite of multimodal tasks at the same time. Um, another concurrent work also found that this is possible where they again 
treated these input modalities as sequences. Uh, language is a sequence of words. Uh, reinforcement, they extended this for reinforcement learning tasks as well. So reinforcement learning tasks is a sequence of states and actions. And all of it allows them to kind of train one single model with the same architecture and same parameters that allow you to do quite a few tasks at the same time. So this allows you to transfer information and share information using one either one single foundation model across multiple tasks. The second sub-challenge we're going to look at is co-learning. In co-learning, instead of using a model, a foundation model trained already on one modality, instead we're just going to look at the data level. Can we transfer information from a secondary to primary modality by sharing the representation spaces in the middle of both modalities? Typically, uh, modality B is injected during training that provides you additional information in helping you to learn this common representation space between A and B and is not subsequently used during testing. Uh, this common embedding space uh, for modality A can then be used for subsequent uh, prediction tasks involving modality A, which is the modality that you care about. We're going to look at two types of this. Um, that they differ depending on where modality B, the secondary modality, is introduced. It can either be introduced at the input level, in which case we'll call it uh, enrichment by fusion, or modality B can also be introduced at the prediction level, in which we'll call it enrichment by translation. In the first, in the first case of learning or co-learning by fusion, perhaps uh, one initial work was that of using word embedding spaces to help you perform visual classification with low resource data. And a core idea here is to learn a common embedding space between images and text, where images and text lie on the same manifold. So in this case, we want a, a centroid for horse, representing a word embedding of horse, and nearby all the image embeddings of various horses that you see in your data set, like ImageNet. And likewise, um, the word embedding for a dog uh, at the cluster center of all the image embeddings of dogs. And likewise, the embedding for auto uh, for the word embedding for auto alongside the, as a cluster center for all the image embeddings of cars that you see in the data set. And how would you learn this space? Well, you've already seen this before, right? This is essentially coordinating your representations, uh, encoding both data using encoders into representation spaces and coordinating using a, a similarity function between both embedding spaces. And the really good thing about this is that once you've trained this embedding space, and let's say you have a new test image from an unknown class. So we know that this is a cat, but let's say you've never seen any images of cats before. If you've done representation coordination properly, then the image embedding of this new image of a cat should be nearby the word embedding of cat. And we know by the structure of word embeddings that cats and dogs are going to be nearby. They're going to share similar uh, features. They're both animals. They have four legs. And then this should allow you to do few shot classification of this image embedding by looking up its nearest word embedding cat. So here's an example of um, using fusion to learn through input, like both images and text are used as input, so it's a fusion, and allowing you to achieve co-learning by allowing you to use word embedding spaces to help you do visual classification. And again, a core idea here is that only images are going to be used at test time once you've structured this word embedding space during training. Another example is simply to learn a joint model. So during training, I'm going to use multimodal data to learn a multimodal model. So in this case, you have uh, you know, human gestures, their audio and whatever they're saying. You use that to learn a common model to make some predictions. And that testing simply replace um, whatever secondary, mod secondary modalities you don't care about, such as video and audio with zeros, and just keep language. So how does this only work? This can be seen as implicit co-learning, right? It only uses a supervised objective function. It doesn't use any other external objective functions like coordination. But still, you're going to use additional video and audio data during training, and they're not required during testing. But the video and audio data you provide during training allows you to learn an enriched representation space so that your model does better at, learn, uh, at classifying language. And we find that only, only using text a test time uh, with multimodal training improves upon language only training. So there is some enrichment going on by introducing video and audio and training, uh, although it's not used at testing. So these are examples of co-learning via fusion. 
There are also some examples of code learning via translation. So in this case, uh, this example is that of using language as input, learning a joint representation space that is then able to reconstruct your visual modality as a forward prediction. This joint representation can then be used for predicting your label, such as sentiment. And the core idea here is that instead of using language and vision as input to learn a joint representation, I can also learn a joint representation by translating from language to the representation space to my visual output. Um, the intuition from this came from the fact that if you're trying to do machine translation, you know, translating from English to French, for example, you are learning a joint representation space that has been formative of both English and French words. Uh, during testing then, uh, so you do cross-modal translation during training, but during testing, all you need to do is take the language modality, put it through a forward pass into the representation space, and then do a forward pass to predict your sentiment. So one small problem here is that how can you actually ensure that both modalities are being used in this translation? Because you're trying to predict both sentiment and the visual modality, your model could very easily just ignore any prediction of the visual modality and just predict sentiment. And that's when these uh, bimodal translation come into play, where in, in addition to doing forward translation from language to visual, you're also doing a backward translation from whatever you predicted in visual back to the language. So then make sure you're trying to predict maximal information about visual as possible so that you can also reconstruct the language backwards. So this again only requires uh, cross-modal translation during training while only language required during testing. And this can be seen as an example of co-learning with the secondary modality that you hope to enrich your representation space with at the output level. So it's a translation problem. Subsequently, people have also tried to scale this up. Uh, and one good example of that is actually using images as a prediction objective to further improve your language models. So you've seen these language models that take in language as input, mask out some tokens, try to reconstruct the mask tokens. That's mask language modeling. So these folks provided this vulcanization idea, which is to, in addition of predicting the mask tokens, also try to predict the images at the same time. So for the so when a model is looking at the word humans, contextualized with other words, can it predict the image corresponding to humans? When it's looking at the word uh, speaking, contextualized with other words, can it also predict the image for speaking? And again, these images are used during training as a prediction objective. They're not used during testing. Only text language is used at testing. But they still find that training by predicting images improves upon training with only language. So that's an example of, again, co-learning via translation. There's many, many more dimensions of transfer. We've only scratched the surface. There's been works in uh, attempting to build a single model that allows you to predict many modalities at the same time. There's also been a lot of work in multimodal, multitask learning. But at the same time, there's many open challenges. Uh, one big open challenge is that of low resource. Um, many of these models that work really well require large amounts of data especially large amounts of paired data, how can we get it to work for little downstream data with little amount of paired data? Uh, another big challenge is that of going beyond language and vision. We have abundant data in the language and vision space. How do we go beyond that? How do we get transfer to work to low resource modalities where transfer is actually important? Uh, there are also settings where these state-of-the-art unimodal encoders are not based on deep learning, such as tabular data. So in this case, it might be much harder to transfer representations from one modality that is based on deep learning with another modality which is not based on deep learning. And finally, most of the work in transfer has been based on very large-scale pre-trained models, um, which raises complexity issues and also interpretability issues. And we're going to look at all of this in the next sub-challenge of quantification. Thank you.